When you say 9, it really means 9.15. OK, so we go for uh, uh, first good morning to everyone. We go for 50 more minutes, and then we stop, and then we'll do a second uh, session of 50 minutes. So today I want to finish the, the basics uh, and uh, finish introducing things I need to start discussing turbulent combustion finally. Um, the first thing I want to do is uh, come back to these laminar flames and look at the problem, which is a canonical problem in some sense, which is the ignition of flame. Uh, that's actually what's happening in all flames. In all flames, we normally ignite them with a spark here in a combustible mixture, and the flame grows, and initially it's a sphere. And uh, a very simple question is to wonder what's the speed of this point here. So when you're a beginner in that field, you say, well, this speed is the flame speed. But actually, we'll see it's not the flame speed. It's something different. And so um, what I'm going to do is to derive the speed at which this flame is moving. And then I will uh, talk about the flow speed also. And uh, then we'll see that this has a very uh, important implication for the whole community. Because this device here is what most people do to measure flame speeds, laminar flame speeds. So let me just begin by this situation here. We have a spark. The flame starts growing in a premix medium. We will say that the flame thickness, delta L0, is 0. We neglect it, which, which is reasonable first order. And the question is, what's the speed here of this point, of the growth of this system? So to derive this speed and this formulation, the most convenient way is to use the consumption speed and to write a balance for the amount of CO2, which is in this box. CO2 is only here. You could have taken water. It's the same. Huh? Uh, and uh, the question is, let's write a balance for the amount of CO2 in this box. So. What is the amount of CO2? It's simple. It's the volume of the sphere multiplied by the density of the burn gases, rho 2, multiplied by the mass fraction of CO2 in the burn gases at equilibrium. Okay. And why does it change? Well, it's changing because every time the flame moves, it adds more CO2. And we know how much CO2 it adds. That's what we wrote yesterday. Yesterday, I told you that if I have one square meter of flame, the flux of CO2 which is created by this flame is Rho1SC, that's the total flux, multiplied by YCO2, which is the concentration of CO2 in the burn gases. So now we know what the total surface, the total area is. It's 4 pi r squared. Okay, so we know how much CO2 we do every second. So you just plug now this expression here. You know that this is a constant, this is a constant, so only r is changing, and you, you just Eliminate things you don't need, and you end up with this formulation. This formulation is uh, telling you that the speed at which this point is moving is not the flame speed. It's the flame speed multiplied by the ratio of the densities. The ratio of the densities is typically 7. So if you ignite a, a, a flame in this room uh, for methane, the flame speed of methane is 40 centimeters per second but the, the sphere is going to grow at 3 meters per second. Okay. And that's due to expansion. It's not, it's not uh, that simple to understand. You can, you can have a, uh, there's a way to imagine why this is so. This is a constant pressure system. So if at a given instant, I'm able to burn these fresh gases here, so I take them and I burn them, suddenly, their density goes from rho 1 to rho 2. Since pressure cannot increase, you need more volume, which automatically will force these gases to use this volume. And this is why, of course, combustion has moved only by SC, delta T, but the volume itself has to expand. That's due expansion due to the flame. Now. What is the flow speed now? If you want to know the flow speed everywhere in the system, first you have to recognize that the burn gases here don't move. They cannot go anywhere. Okay? They are stuck in the sphere. So the burn gases don't move. So there is zero velocity from here to there. And here, if you want to know 
what the flow speed is, you just can write a global balance on the red line here, which is a fixed line, and uh, express that the variation of mass here is equal to the flux which is leaving this box. The flux leaving this box is a negative flux. It's minus 4 pi r squared multiplied by rho 1, because rho 1 is the density of the fresh gases here, multiplied by the velocity that we're looking for. And the total mass in the box, it's easy. It's the, bo it's the mass of burned gases plus the mass of the fresh gases. So again, you derive that and you find this expression. And if you plot this expression, it looks like this. So there is, this is the center of the explosion. Zero speed for the burned gases. There's a maximum speed here, and then the speed decreases as a function of 1 over r squared. So this is, again, this blast effect. Okay, if I ignite a flame here, long before the flame will reach you, you will feel the wind induced by the flame. Okay? That's dilatation. And this, is, this can be quite a strong velocity. And the expressions are, are given here. Now, if I have written here the, 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 the expression of the flow velocity, the expression of the absolute velocity, so I can deduce the displacement velocity. And the displacement velocity, like I said yesterday, the question is where do you evaluate it? If you evaluate it exactly at the flame front here, then you find it's equal to the consumption speed. The problem is that if you think now of an experiment or even of a simulation, uh, you can see here it's very difficult to be exactly at that point. Uh, where you will be located, at the point where you will be located to measure you, you will have a different result. And so experimentally, people are trying to do that. They're trying to resolve. There is no, the thickness is not zero in the real world. The thickness, the flame would look like this, like that. And the question is, where are you going to measure the displacement speed? And in practice, it's a very noisy uh, mechanism. So making these measurements has always been a big, big source of problems. Uh, so just to comment, of course, the consumption speed cannot be measured because it's the integral of the reaction weight, and no one knows how to measure reaction weights today. We never measure the reaction weight. Measuring the displacement speed, as I said, on the paper, it's possible because you can have, for example, the front speed using tomography at two instants. You can do PIV for the flow. But even if you have all that, you have to decide exactly where you're going to measure at which point you're going to define the displacement speed. And today, it's, uh, this has been the source of numerous papers in the past. People have been fighting about the precision of these things. And it's, a, it's a mess. What makes things more complicated is that everything I have told you here was assuming that the flame thickness was zero. If the flame thickness is not zero, it's even more complicated. You can take a look at that in a, at the theoretical derivation here in this chapter, and uh, it's, it's, it's tough. So I want to open now uh, an important point, which is related to what I've just said, which is how do we measure flame speeds? You know, everyone is saying laminar flame speed is 40 centimeters per second for methane air uh, at ambient conditions. How do you measure speeds? Well, it's a, a, the truth is that it's not a solved problem today if you want to have it with precision. Of course, you can do a computation. You can take a full chemical scheme, and when a 1D code like Cantera or Chemkin or Cosilab, all these codes, and you will get the speed. Now you have to remember what we said yesterday. These codes may be based on a good kinetic scheme, but we know that kinetic schemes are not that good. But in addition to kinetics, if you want to do a flame, you also need to do transport. And transport, we have no real idea of what's going on. So what's really happening when you have a new kinetic scheme is that people tune things. You know, and how do they do this tuning? Well, they tune it on an experiment. Okay? So when you do a computation, you actually rely on a measurement. It's not an ab initio computation, you know, something which would come out from God and tell you speed is that much. You're tuning things. So it's not, it's not a good idea to do that if you, if you have no measurement. What you can do is if you, are, if you believe in your kinetic scheme at equivalence ratio equal 0.8, and you need to go to 0.6 or to 1, Probably that, that's, that's reliable. That's a, good, that's a good thing. So in any case, what we need is a measurement. So how do you obtain flame speed? Well, it's, it's, it's an old problem. And uh, you will see that it's a complex one. And it, even today, 
there's a big community of people working on this problem and fighting at every symposium about my method is better than your method to compute to measure flame speed. So I just want to to present two two classical methods for flame speed measurement. The first one is the intuitive method. You take a tube, you ignite a flame, and you look at the flame going down, and you measure its speed. Okay, that, that would look like a simplest thing to do. And the second one is actually the spherical flame. Um, I won't talk about the other ones here, because they, are even, they raise even more questions. So let's take the, the intuitive thing that you can do. Actually. I know probably you do that here. We do that uh, at my lab you know, for the students. You take a tube. Uh, normally it's closed on one side, but you can leave it open, it doesn't change much, you ignite at one end, and the flame moves like this, and you can measure its speed. And then you have a, you have a flame speed measurement. When people started doing that, uh, probably around 1900 something, um, they reported flame velocities, and no one found the same velocity. And it took them about 10 years to see that the flame propagating in a small tube like this one was not going at the same speed as the flame propagating in a big tube. This one was going more slowly than that one. So um, they, they realized that the size of the tube was important. And then they said, let's make a big tube. When they tried to make a big tube, they got into another problem, is that the flame did not remain flat. It started doing these things. And so if you use a small tube, the, sm the tube diameter affects the speed. If you use a big tube, you don't have a plane of flame anymore. So let me show you an example here that's a famous lab uh, in France, uh, in Marseille, where they did all kinds of very nice experiments on laminar flames. So this is a tube here which is tilted this way. They ignite at the top, and the flame goes down. Their objective was not to measure flame speeds. They wanted to look at instabilities. But as you will see, you get both for the, the same price here. So, so this is a propane air. It's a lean propane air. You ignite at the top. And you see that the flame is actually plane uh, for a short time. This is a different equivalence ratio now. <coughs> you ignite at the top. And you see that uh, after this point here, the flame gets uh, crazy uh, because it, it's, it's creating cells. So let me show you now a cut. It's a tomographic cut. So you should have a plane of flame front. And you see that you develop these cells. For some very complicated reason that I don't want to describe here, there is a moment where this thing gets coupled with the acoustics of the tube and leads to a plane of flame for a few milliseconds, as, it, as you can see now. But then this front itself starts making structures. Now the flame is going to go up, so the flame is here now. We have moved the camera. And look at the shape of this thing. I mean, we want to measure the speed of a flat front. Instead of that, we have this monster now. You cannot do any measurement there, OK? So, that happens almost systematically when you try to do plane of flame. Please? This is tomography. You, so you, have a, you, you seed the flow, and you have a laser sheet going through, so you can visualize the flame position in the central uh, plane of the, of the duct. Yeah, it's a high-speed camera. Well, not so, it's not going that fast, I think. Huh? It's a few. Or they don't indicate it. You know, the flame's not only going to 20 centimeters per second. So I, I guess with a camera at 2,000 frames per second, you, you get it. So now people said, OK, uh, we're not going to do it in the plane of flame. Let's try to do it in a spherical flame. Now, the spherical flame is a fascinating one, because then it gets all kinds of problems. So this is a bomb, and most combustion labs have one. Okay? Everyone can, you can build a bomb, you fill it with gases, you ignite it, and go. And people started doing these things more than 100 years ago. So again, here we find our spherical flame. We ignite at the center of the bomb. We have windows. And we look at the flame grows. There's a, there's a very, uh, uh, very nice movie here by this team where they, you can see the spark. And you will see here, this is, all these cases are different cases. You have the stoichiometric case here. Then you go rich on that side. Then you go lean on that side. And you, so you ignite. There is no flow. And you look at the flame grows. Then of course. You can see that uh, the, the lean cases, for example, go extremely slowly. And so we can guess, of course, that the speed is more here than here, larger than that. And this is the smallest speed. Okay. Then if you want to be quantitative, you want to use these measurements now to find the flame speed. How do you do that? Well, the only thing you measure in this experiment is really the flame position. You measure 
this point versus time. Once you have this point versus time, you can extract the flame speed. How do you do that? Well, you know that the, the velocity of this point is dr dt is equal to that. So if you want the flame speed, you have to write this expression. You measure dr dt, and then you, have, you, have, you arrive at the point where you say, ah, oh, I need rho 2 over rho 1. Looks like a detail, uh, but it's not. It's actually the worst problem in this system. How do you find rho 2 over rho 1? Well, normally, rho 2 is the density of the burn gases. You could say, I'm going to compute it with a code, okay. equilibrium, and then I get a value for rho 2. And rho 1, you get it by saying, when the flame is small, the, temp the pressure does not go up too much in my bomb, so rho 1 is the initial density. And that's what everyone is doing. But that, that doesn't work. Why? Well, because the density here in the burn gases in this model has to be homogeneous. In practice, it's not homogeneous. You will see why in a second. The second problem is that if you rely on an equilibrium computation, you rely on another model again. You rely on, you've seen yesterday, we're going to minimize the Gibbs energy and all that. You know, you may be wrong. It's not really a measurement anymore. It's a mixed result between a measurement and a model. And for example, if this flame is radiating, then it will be colder, rho 2 will be larger, you will, you will not know it. So uh, that's the first problem. The second problem is that it is still a bomb, so the pressure is still going up. So when you say that rho 1 is constant, probably it's not a good idea. So we end up with something which gives us a C, but it's not a clear measurement. It's a measurement mixed with some modeling idea here. So what we did, for example, we did a simulation of this problem. You can do that. You take a, a spherical flame. You can write a code in spherical uh, coordinates. And you start by here is the center of the flame. Here is the initial condition. So it's burnt in the center. And here it's cold. And you let it go. And the first thing you see is that uh, the temperature profile here is not constant. It's not like this. It's colder here, and it's warmer on the side. And with time, it goes like this. And if you look at the model, the model which we have used to, to, to derive this expression assumes that you are at equilibrium here and at uh, uh, unburned condition here. And you see, that actually, that equilibrium will be reached, but long, 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 long afterwards. So the, the error which is introduced by this thing is big. It's a few percent, you know. Between, you can see actually, you know, when you say, for example, that uh, at this point you should be here, and actually you are here, you know, you get uh, at least 10% error on row 2 over row 1. So you have a 10% error on the flame speed. And these things continue, you know, if we plot over time, you see it takes a long, long, long time. T adiabatic is here, you see we're going to go there, but it takes time. So wh why? Uh, so that raises an interesting question. Why do we have this funny shape here? Why isn't the flow? I mean, it's, a, it's a flame. So you burn, you should go to equilibrium. Well, you go to equilibrium, we have said before, you go to equilibrium in the absence of any fluid mechanical process. Here, there is a big fluid mechanical process I'm going to describe now, and it's flame stretch. And uh, the stretch effects, actually, in those flames is what makes uh, this problem. And I will come back to that in a second, because I need now to introduce stretch. stretch is a basic quantity in laminar flames, and it's even more important in turbulent flames. So let me um, oh, oh yeah, just conclude about these spherical flames. People are using spherical flames every day. There are many advantages to that. For example, you can use the spherical flames at 40 bars, 60 bars. You, know, you can go to very high pressures. So that's good. Uh, but the disadvantage is that uh, the measurements that you obtain from spherical flame measurements are not that good. Okay? So uh, you cannot do the measurements when the flame is too small because it's affected by the spark. You cannot do the measurements when the flame is too big because the pressure is going up and you touch the wall. And you have a, sm a short moment where you should be able to do the measurements, but they are usually quite noisy. Um, what's happening also, even in these spherical flames, is that those flames do not remain flat. This is a visualization uh, from the the USC group, you start with a spherical flame here. But as you can see, very rapidly, even on those flames, you get structures. And then, of course, you know, that, that they change the shape that, changed, that would change the flame speed that you, that you would measure. How can visualizing this research begin? 
Uh, this one, I think it's a high-speed camera, and you just look directly. It's a shadow graph method. I think they just have backwards uh, illumination because you see the shape. Right? It's a 3D. Yeah, because of the density, you can reduce the Yeah. Well, every time you see uh, this thing, it, that's a cell actually. It's a cell on the flame. The flame is not pl flat, so you can you can see those cells here. And normally, you know, any visualization method will show them. They are nice. I mean, they are big and uh, easy to to visualize. So as a result. There is a, a, an interesting science today, which is uh, uh, gathering all the measurements for flame speeds. For example, here you have the, the simplest one, the one that everyone's doing, methane air, 300k, one bar. That's basic one. And um, you see that if you, pl you pl I could have put maybe 40 values here of all the groups. I've picked up a few just to show you the dispersion of results. Okay, uh, at stoichiometry which is the value that everyone is measuring, people start you know, agreeing on the value which is uh, no, 38 something, 37 something. But there is a, a curve that, uh, that is produced by uh, Fokion and Golfopoulos, where it's a new science where you put here the year, and here you put the flame speed for one case. And you see that when you plot the values of the different groups, you see this kind of behavior. In other words, you see that as time goes by, we are more or less decreasing the uncertainty. But that really tells you that it's really not you know, a deterministic process. Uh, and it could be actually that everyone is happy to find the same speed as his neighbor. Uh, that doesn't prove it's the good value. Okay? So it's, it's disturbing that something as simple as what is the flame speed uh, is giving us so much trouble. So you could say, well, it's not a problem. Well, it is a major problem. Let me give you an example that we had when we worked for, for Siemens, for example. If you look at the at the Siemens gas turbine, and the numbers here are approximate, those are confidential information, so don't take them uh, as they are here, but let's just say that uh, in, for certain cases in these turbines, you enter at a high temperature with a very lean flame at a very high pressure. And so there's a basic question, which is, what is the flame speed there? Well, you cannot make the measurement, or Siemens would have to pay for that, but that's, uh, that's a diffi difficult experiment. We know that because it's hot, the flame goes faster, but we know that because it's lean, the flame is slower, and we know that because the pressure is high, the flame speed also is less, and uh, we cannot do any measurement. So what do we do? We do a computation. So we took probably the three best schemes for methane air at these conditions. And they are not really, you know, they are not validated at these conditions because if there is no measurement, you have to rely on what you can. And what we saw is that in that case, one scheme was telling us it's quenched. There's no flame. Because, you know, for 0 0.55, it's pretty lean, pretty close to the flammability limit. Another scheme was giving us 6 centimeters per second, and another one was giving us 15. So now, you do the LES of this flow, and at the starting point, you don't even know what the flame speed is. And I remember these guys from Siemens saying, hey, the commercial community should know. I say, well, that's the state of the art today. For these conditions, for a fuel as simple as methane, we are not even sure the flame's burning. That's, that's bad, OK? But it's, that's the state of the art. So you have to be aware that uh, in certain cases, you don't even know the flame speed. So <laughs> it makes life life a little bit complicated. Of course, the solution, if you want to do it cleanly, you need to pay for an experiment at this pressure in these conditions. That's, that's just no other way to do it well. Remember also that this is an easy case, somehow, because it's a gaseous fuel. If you do kerosene or gasoline, in addition to this problem, you would need to vaporize the fuel before if you want to do a flame speed measurement that the system gets a little bit more complicated. You need to uh, vaporize the fuel, mix it with the air. Everything must be insulated. It's, it's, it's a problem. In that case, when you are not sure about the flame speed, then how you proceed for that? You uh, get some comparison with the external data at the exhaust, or what you, how do you go forward? Well, <laughs> you make a choice. You, you take the scheme that you believe is the best. No, you, if you have no measurement, you have, to, you, have to, you have to trust the chemist and you have to ask them, you know, should you use Grimec 2 or Grimec 3? 
or should you use the scheme of uh, Heinz Speech or the scheme of Varnatz, and which one would you trust? But I believe everyone is just extrapolating from things we don't know. Uh, you know, also the other things I have not started discussing is that for very lean flames, we know that radiation plays a big role, and there is no radiation in those codes. So uh, uh, I, will, I will come back to that also in a second. Laminar flame speeds, when you go to extreme cases, are very sensitive to uh, ex external problems like radiation or soot formation, which then radiates. And these things are not included in uh, 1D flame codes. So it's much better to stick to stoichiometry. But here, there are cases where you have to go to very lean cases. And then you, are, you, you, you have a major problem. And it's only methane when you do kerosene. So. OK, now we now to need to talk about stretch. Stretch is a very strange thing. The specificity of flames, especially in turbulence, is that you can take <coughs> Uh, uh, a flame, of which is one square meter, put it in a turbulent flow, wait a few milliseconds, and then you have two square meters of flame. That's, that's magic. If you think about it, if I could do the same thing with a uh, $100 bill, you know, I wouldn't be here. You, know? you take $100 bill and make it two, three, and four. That doesn't work, OK? It works only for flames. For some reason, you can take a flame and increase its surface. And you measure that by the weight at which the flame increases. This is seconds minus 1. It's 1 over A, D, A, D, T, where A is the area. And the values of stretch that you have in most turbulent flows are, you know, can be easily 100, 500 seconds minus 1. That means that uh, it takes only a few milliseconds to multiply the surface by 2. And uh, there is a limit to that, because, of course, you can stretch the flame, it's like an elastic if you want. You can stretch it slowly. If you try to stretch it too fast, then it will break. What means break for a flame? It means quench. Okay. And we know that there are, for example, in piston engines, if you increase the turbulence too much, at some point the flame will stop burning. So there is a limit to what stretch can be you know, useful to. Uh, but still, this stretch is really the reason why uh, a turbulent flame can exist. Okay, because we can create more and more flame surface. So before we start talking about turbulent flames, we can discuss stretch in laminar flames. And you need to understand first what's going on for laminar flame. So the, the thing that you, let me change that so that you can see it. The thing that uh, can be written, and that's a, purely, that's a clean uh, derivation, it's exact. You can written stretch, the flame stretch, just by kinematic con consideration of a surface in the flow. And when you do that, that's, that's in this paper, if you want to look at the demonstration, you find that there are two components to stretch of a surface. The first component is the strain in the plane which is tangent to the flame. That, that's reasonable to understand. Again, if you have a flame, a flame like this one, and the velocity here is not the same as the velocity there, there is a gradient in this plane, it really means that you're going to pull apart these two points. So you start from here, you come back one millisecond later, these two points are here, you have created all this surface. So stretch is due to the velocity. Now there is a second effect to stretch, which is not that obvious, is that stretch is due to curvature. This is the gradient of the normal. Those of you who have looked a little bit at a uh, Geometry here should remember that uh, this is actually 1 over the radius of curvature. So this term here is, can be written also SD over R. This is the displacement speed, the one we have introduced before. And this is the curvature. So what does this thing say? It tells you that if you have a flame which is curved, then its surface will change just because of flame propagation. That's um, a rather obvious thing if you plot it. If the flame is here, and it's propagating normal to itself, and you come back later, one millisecond later, you have more surface here than here. Vice versa, this is a, an algebraic term. If your flame is contracting, you will have less surface. And stretch at the end is a combination of these two terms. Now, uh, you can do all kinds of stretch flames. You have planar 
flames, where the flame is flat, so this term is zero, where the stretch is only due to the velocity gradient. You see here the velocity gradient is that this point goes in this direction, this one goes there, so this flame is stretched. It's a uh, somehow disturbing notion because when you look at this flame, you have the impression that the flame surface does not change because it, it's true. I mean, the flame surface, if you do the experiment, you will see a flame which seems to have a constant surface. But it's not the case, actually. The surface is increasing at the center, and it's pushed away on the side, and there is stretch in those flames. Now, these flames come in different kinds. You know, there is what we call uh, the stagnation pond flame, where you blow fresh gases against combustion products. That's the single flame. You can also do the twin flame, where you blow two fresh gases jets against each other. And then you have two flames here. It's a symmetrical configuration. And of course, another example of stretch flame is the spherical flame again. The Well, the stretch, you mean for those flames? Well, <laughs> well when, you look at the, when you look at the spherical flame, the, the best way to compute, I'm going to do it in a second, the best way to compute stretch is to work with the surface, because you know the surface is growing, so you know that it's stretched. There's no, uh, you can compute it directly. I will do it in a second. If you look now at, the, at these things, you can evaluate stretch. For example, uh, if you look at the stagnation point flame, you have an idea of the gradient. I mean, the gradient of velocity in this direction is linked to the gradient of velocity in this direction because of continuity. And the gradient is just u1 minus minus u2 because they are opposed velocities. So it's u1 plus u2 divided by the distance. So if you blow harder, you strain it more. And if you put these two burners closer to each other, you stretch it more too. Now, this is a plot of the velocity for a stagnation pond flame. This is a computation along this line here. So here, this point is the stagnation plane. There is zero velocity here. The velocity has to turn around here. The flow has to turn around that point. And here, you see that when you start here, the velocity decreases. When you go through the flame front, the velocity increases again because density is changing. And then finally, you go to zero. And the mean stretch here would be this quantity. Now, of course, there's a problem here to define what the stretch is at the flame front. You have to know where the flame is. But let's say globally that this gives you an idea of how you compute stretch in a stagnation point flame. And it is a major problem because there are many ways to compute stretch in a stagnation point flame. On the other hand, if you look at a spherical flame, there is no problem to define stretch. Actually, it's a very surprising result to first order because all spherical flames have the same stretch, whatever the flame is. So that's a, a, a funny thing. If you write just what the surface is, 4 pi r square, and you compute k, you find that k here is 2 over r dr dt. Okay? And since you know that to first order dr dt is linked to the flame speed multiplied by the density ratio, you plug it here, and everything goes away. You're just left with k equal 2 over t. So if you take a spherical flame, its stretch is 2 over t, whatever the flame is. That's a nice result in some sense. Uh, but it's also telling you something, is that the spherical flame is infinitely stretched when it begins. When it's very small, every second you know, its surface is going so fast that its stretch is very large. And that's one of the problems we have with the spherical flame, actually is that because it is stretched so much, so, f so f strongly when it begins, it will affect its flame speed. And so it will change <coughs> SC. And then things will get complicated. Remember, we, we assumed that we would be able to extract SC from this expression. We would measure the RDT. We would evaluate rho 1 over rho 2. But in practice, <coughs> the problem is that SC is not a constant. When the flame is very small, it is affected by stretch. And that means really that what we have to invert now is a relation like dr dt equal rho 2 over rho 1 sc of k. k is the stretch, and k is a function of dr dt itself. And so things get much more complicated because now you need a model for sc as a function of stretch. So we come back to a, a, a basic question. <coughs> if I have a flame and I stretch it, um, 
even if it survives, what is its speed? How is speed of a flame, how is it affected by stretch? And um, so this is a problem which has been around for a long time in the community, and uh, <coughs> people have looked at it in details. <coughs> so the first thing you do when you want to see that, you derive a theory by starting uh, with uh, single step chemistry, uh, simple, uh, chem simple Lewis transport, uh, you simplified everything you can, and you can actually derive by hand exactly the expression of the flame speed as a function of stretch. And this is where you find the famous Marksting lines. So what this thing is saying is that the speed of a flame, normalized by its speed when it's unstretched, is 1 minus the stretch multiplied by this number here, which is a normalization factor. And here, the length which appears is the Marksting length. And the Marksting length <coughs> can be computed when the flame is supposed to be single step, etc. very simple flame. And uh, it's been a field of investigation for a lot of very famous people uh, in, the, in, the, in our community. And you can read these papers. Matalon probably is the guy who has tried to explain, because uh, these papers are impossible to read. Okay? You read the first page, and then pss, you, they go into uh, uh, purely theoretical arguments, and it takes you two years to understand. Matalon probably did the best job trying to explain that. So uh, <coughs> the way they, they like to present the result is the following. They say, <coughs> a, good, a good quantity to scale a marksting length is the flame thickness. <coughs> and this is what we call the marksting number. The marksting number is the ratio of the marksting length to the flame thickness. This marksting length, this marksting number, gives you an idea of the sensitivity of the flame to stretch. Now, the trick with the marksting length is that it's extremely difficult to measure you realize that the Marksting length now is like a derivative of the flame speed. And uh, most honest people, when they measure the Marksting length, they will give you, for example, the Marksting length here. They will tell you the Marksting length is 0.2 plus or minus 2. Okay. That's the typical uh, uh, discussion you see in the community, because it's very difficult to measure. So you can derive this Marksting length from theory. If you say single step chemistry, constant CP, simple Lewis numbers, and I will show you a few examples of these things. So the Marksting length depends on what you assume also for the thermal conductivity. So if you say the thermal conductivity is constant, this is the Marksting length that you obtain. So you can just plug in here your temperature jump, you integrate that, and you find a number. If you suppose that lambda is proportional to t squared, you find this, etc. Lambda is really proportional to t, okay? so that's, that's a good expression. You see that in the Marksting length, you have the Lewis number, which appears. It's the Lewis number of the deficient reactants, so it's for lean flames. So this is usually the fuel. So it means really that the Marksting length of uh, hydrogen is going to be very different from the Marksting length of propane, for example. So. There are Marksting lengths for the displacement speed and for the consumption speed. This one was for the displacement speed. For the consumption speed, you have the same type of expression. You know, there's one term less, but it's uh, the same type of expression. You see an interesting thing for the consumption speed is that the Marksting length changes sign with the Lewis number compared to unity. So if you have above unity or below unity, in one case, the flame will go up. In another case, the flame will go down. Now, these guys also in those days, I mean, they, again, they had no computers, so they had time to, time to think. And uh, so they did all kinds of additional derivation. They included the effect of stretch on the flame and the effect of losses. Uh, losses for those flames are usually radiative losses. That's the, the most evident one. And uh, <coughs> what they do, they plot the consumption speed, normalized by its value for the unstretched case, as a function of stretch. And you see here <coughs> that if the, the, the flame is stretched, the consumption speed will, for that case, remain constant almost for a long time. And then if the, flow, the flame is completely adiabatic, this thing keeps going forever. I mean, you can stretch the flame, you know, and it will keep burning. It will go down very slowly. But if you put a little bit of losses, then there is a turning point. You know, the commercial community likes this 
turning point, which really means that here you quench the flame. And we know that you can do the experiment. If you take the stagnation point flame, you ignite it, you increase the velocity. At some point, poof, the flame goes away. So we know that we can quench a flame because of, quen because of stretch. Now, this depends now on the Lewis number. This is the result of the Lewis number equal unity. If you do a Lewis number less than unity, because you have 1 minus Lewis in the expression, you see that here, when you stretch the flame, it will actually burn more. And if you stretch it enough, then at some point it will quench. But that's, that's an opposite case compared to Lewis number less than unity, where the stretch will decrease the flame speed, and then you have quenching. So this would be a propane lean flame. This would be a methane, uh, hydrogen, sorry, hydrogen lean flame. And so you see that stretch is playing a role. And that also explains the results I've shown you before for the spherical flame. The spherical flame is not at zero stretch. It has a very large stretch. So its speed is affected by stretch. And then uh, uh, it's not the laminar flame speed you are measuring. You're measuring something else. OK, I will go back to this business of uh, stretch flames when we talk about uh, turbulent flames tomorrow, because we're going to use exactly the same concepts for turbulent flames. We're going to talk about stretch all the time. <coughs> OK, let me jump now to uh, diffusion flames. Uh, <coughs> as you've seen yesterday also, uh, premix flames are nice. They have lots of advantages. But there are many cases where you don't want to premix things. You'd like to burn something in a diffusion mode. So what is a diffusion flame? A diffusion flame is a situation where you inject fuel on one side of the burner, oxidizer on the other side of the burner, and now these things have to mix and burn at the same time. Now, the interesting thing about the, the, the theory for uh, diffusion flames is that it's completely different from what we do for premixed flames. There is a very nice theory, which is based on mixture fraction, which I'm going to develop now. And uh, this, the objective of this theory is to explain the structure that we expect to find for this diffusion flame. So what do we expect to find? Well, we believe that uh, <coughs> there will be oxidizer arriving on one side, fuel entering the flame on the other side, and in the center, there should be a flame. So the temperature should look like this. And then it's a, it's a strange situation, you know, because all the action takes place here. So the oxidizer must diffuse into this zone, the fuel also, and then the products must go away so that this thing can keep burning. And uh, we have to find a way to describe this. Now, <coughs> the basic uh, tool here is to build passive scalars. Uh, I've already said you know, that our big problem in combustion is those equations with source terms, because these source terms are just very, very complicated. Kinetic, kinetics are there. So we like equations where we have no source term, and we call it a passive scalar. Um, if you have a, this is an equation for passive scalar, z, big Z. And uh, uh, I just want to, to introduce a few things here. <coughs> if two passive scalars, z1 and z2, have the same boundary conditions in the domain, then you can prove that they're going to be equal if time is sufficiently long. Uh, if they are equal at t equals 0, they will always remain equal. And if they differ at t equals 0, they will converge to the same value after a few characteristic times. So I can do this demonstration by you know, a lot of mathematics. Uh, uh, I think it's better to, to, to give an intuitive demonstration. You see that, you know that this equation for passive scalar can also be written like this, where dz dt is the uh, uh, particle derivative. So that's the derivative when you travel along the flow. So what, it, what this really means is that this equation is a very simple one. dz dt is my derivative of z when I travel in this room because I'm convected by the flow. Okay? So the flow is carrying me. And wherever I go, this is, my, this is the derivative of my quantities. The second term is diffusion. Diffusion means that if I travel in this room, every time I see someone who has a larger z or a smaller z, then I exchange z with him. Okay, I diffuse z towards him. So that's really what this equation is telling you. You are convected in a domain. Every time you see someone who has a gradient of z, that's a big z, by the way. Uh, every time you see someone with a gradient, then you exchange with him. So suppose now that you have two passive scalars, z1 and z2. If you construct the difference between these two, z2 minus z1, 
is going to change only because of this process of diffusion and on all boundary conditions it will be zero. So suppose now that you have a quantity z where the boundary conditions are zero everywhere and you follow this equation. Well, uh, you know, if at time equals zero, z is equal to zero everywhere, all the gradients will be zero, the derivative will be constant, z will never change. If for some reason you are here and you have z equal one half, well, when you travel, at some point you will touch this point or come close to this point, and this point is at zero by the definition. And so you will be slowly brought also to zero. And after a long time, if you travel long enough in this zone, everyone will go to zero. This is what we say, why we say if you wait sufficiently long, then the only solution to this problem is z equals zero, which means that z2 will be equal to z1. And we'll use this uh, demonstration in a, in a few seconds. OK. <clears throat> Let's start now by the definition of what mixture fraction is. Uh, the definition of a passive scalar is an equation without source term. And the definition of the passive scalar, there is one specific one, which is the mixture fraction. It's the passive scalar, which goes from 1 in the fuel stream to 0 in the oxidizer stream. I just want to um, indicate by the way that when you look at a f statement like this one, it really implies that uh, we're talking about a system which has only two inlets. So there will be the fuel stream and the oxidizer stream. Okay? So the, passive the mixture fraction here, Z, must be equal to 1. And here it must be equal to 0. Now, if you have more than two inlets, you're on your own. Okay? So all this uh, business of mixture fraction, which is the basis of, you would see, I would say, 95% of the models for uh, diffusion flames, including turbulent diffusion flames, it works only if you have only two inlets. If you have more than two inlets, you cannot do that. You can do other things, but it's getting more complicated. So the mixture fraction is, in this system, it's a quantity which is a solution of this equation, which is 1 here and 0, one here and zero on the other side. <coughs> now, you note, of course, that because of the property I've shown you before, all the passive scalars going from 1 in the fuel to 0 in the oxidizer are equal to the mixture fraction. Okay? There's only one mixture fraction. So now if we want to construct a theory based on mixture fraction, we need to assume a few things. The first thing we assume is that we have constant pressures and equal CPKs. OK, that's a bad assumption. But again, everyone is doing it. Huh? Uh, we have to say that all the Lewis numbers are equal to unity. And we have to assume that there's a global single step reaction. If you say all that, and you say that the reaction is this one fuel plus oxidizer goes to product, you can write right away that the, the fuel consumption omega dot f controls everything else. If you burn one kilogram of fuel, you burn s kilogram of oxidizer. And if you burn one kilogram of fuel, you generate a heat which is minus q omega dot f. So you can write these equations like this. And uh, that really means that if you want to solve now for a diffusion flame problem, you need three quantities. You need to solve for the fuel mass fraction, the oxidizer mass fraction, and the temperature. Remember, when I did the de demonstration for premixed flames, I started by eliminating everything except temperature. I only, I only one variable, which was temperature. Now, for diffusion flames, I need at least the fuel mass fraction, the oxidizer mass fraction, and the temperature, because these things are independent. They are not mixed, so we have to account for mixing. So let's start by the, the first uh, problem, which is actually a problem which is encountered in many other fields than combustion. If you look at pollution dispersion, that's what you do all the time. It's a problem where there is no heat release for the moment. So I've started my burner here. I've started injection of oxidizer and fuel, but I've not ignited. And I'm just wondering, can I solve these equations? You know, can I know the field of fuel mass fraction, oxidizer, and temperature? Because temperature can be different. Okay, Here I have one temperature, T or zero. Here I have one temperature, Tf0. In most burners, uh, because of compression, the oxidizer will be hot, and the fuel, in general, will be cold. So this is 300K, and this is 700K. So that means that 
the fuel mass fraction itself is directly a passive scalar because it has no source term, there's no combustion. Same thing for the fuel, same thing for the temperature. I have, because Cp is constant, I have divided here lambda by Cp. And because Lewis number is equal to unity, we know that rho d is equal to lambda over Cp. And we're going to use this property. How do we use them? Well, we, we, we divide the first equation by the inlet fuel mass fraction. So that's the fuel mass fraction here. We divide <coughs> the oxidizer equation by the inlet oxidizer mass fraction. And we divide T by the difference of temperatures between the two streams. And then when you do that, <coughs> you end up with the same equation. I mean, this equation will have an equation for YF over YFO, YO over YOO, and temperature normalized by TFO by TOO. And these things actually have all the same equations. So that's one scalar, one passive scalar. That's another one. And if I scale them the way it should, all these passive scalars have the same boundary condition, one in the fuel zero in the oxidizer. So they are all equal to the mixture fraction. And you see that in a flow like this one, all these quantities are all equal to the mixture fraction. And you can plot them <coughs> in what we call the Z diagram. <coughs> the Z diagram is a diagram where we represent everything as a function of the mixture fraction. And you see, for example, that uh, in this diagram, the fuel mass fraction is this quantity. It's YFO multiplied by Z. The oxidizer is YOO multiplied by 1 minus Z. And the temperature is just ZTF0 plus 1 minus ZTO0, which is like a, a weighting average of the two streams. <coughs> so this is what we call the mixing lines. If you go in this system <coughs> and you tell me here that you know the value of Z, then I can tell you right away, OK, you know Z, I can give you temperature, fuel, and oxidizer mass fraction. So in the end, in this problem, there's only one independent variable, the mixture fraction. It's just mixing at the end. You, know, you could have written this equation just by intuition. You know, say, I have two streams. I take Z on that side, one minus Z on the other side. The result is a mixture of the two. OK, just before we stop, I just want to uh, go back to what Z is really. Uh, we, we keep saying Z is a mixture fraction. I just want to show you what mixture means here. If you sit in this burner and you, you look at, the, at a given point, you will see that at this given point, since there are only two inlets, there's a part of the mass there which comes from stream 1, which is M1. And there's a part in this stream, there's a proportion of fuel which is M1 multiplied by the fuel mass fraction. So here, I have a mass of fuel which is M1 YF0. Now the mass coming from stream 2 is M2. And the total mass, of course, at that point is M1 plus M2. So that the fuel mass fraction at this point is M1 YF0 divided by M1 plus M2. So the mixture fraction at that point is going to be the ratio of that. So it's M1 divided by M1 plus M2. And this shows you that uh, uh, the mixture fraction is what you expect it to be. At one point in the burner, it tells you in percentage how much is coming from stream 1. Okay. So for example, if you have z equal 0.5, it means that you're mixing the same mass from stream 1 and stream 2. If you have z equal 1, it means really you are located here. z equals 0, you are located here. So it's really a measure of the mixing between the two streams. And uh, uh, again, it means also that if z has a given value, you know that z kilograms coming from that side, z 1 minus z coming from the other side. But careful, again, that works only if all the Lewis numbers are equal. We'll see extensions later, but uh, they, are, they are more tricky. So we're going to move to uh, the case with combustion after the break. Uh, we're going to do the same thing, but now this part was easy. Now we're going to do it with, with reaction, and you're going to see that we can do almost the same thing. And uh, that will be after the break. So if you have questions, we can take them now, or we can go and uh, have a short break. You have to correct the flame speed. There are, there are very few flames which are not unstretched. So you always, well, in most cases, you have to correct the speed to account for the effects of stretch.
if it's a steady flame, yeah. No, no, because stretch can be uh, stretch is the sum of two terms, so you can have a planar flame and a stretched flame with the same stretch but with different shapes. It means that <coughs> the beauty of this thing is that you don't need another parameter in addition to stretch to characterize the structure of a flame. If you know stretch on the flame, you know everything. You don't need to know if it's curved. Uh, Strain, no, no. If you know the stretch, you know everything. O on paper, okay? According to the theory. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theoretical approach. It's like a first order approximation to what's going on. So normally, if you know stretch, you know everything. And uh, when you are talking about training, uh, 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 huh? Yeah. You don't even need heat loss. If you run uh, Kemkin, for example, or Cantera, you will see that uh, they work really well at the stoichiometry. And when you go to the lean regions, they just have problems to converge. They, they, because the heat release is so small that even the code has difficulties. And so it really means that uh, some of these codes where uh, when you go from uh, stoichiometry here at 1, and you go in this region here, 0.55 or something like this, the codes here even start having problems to converge to a value. And when they have problems to converge, many of them say there's no flame, which may not be true. It just means that they cannot find it. There may be a flame, but these flames, you know, the point here is that if you have no heat losses at all, this curve goes to zero very smoothly like this. And so, but here, it's, it's, this flame would not exist in real life, okay? It's only in the computer because it's adiabatic. In the real life, any heat losses will give you this curve. So when you enter this region with, with this uh, 1D flame code, the uncertainties become extremely large and it's, uh, it's very difficult. It tells you something about the flame, you know. It tell, because, you know, the, the whole business here is that when you plot this curve, the temperature does the same thing. You go from 2200K, where you have a very strong reaction. Here you are 1500, 1400. And we know that in this region, because you have exponentials of temperature, a small variation in plus or minus can lead the flame to quenching or not. So it's really, the problem becomes unstable because physically, these flames are very, very close to quenching. And uh, so numerically, it's a very difficult problem. So, I mean, then how would one go? So, if you have to simulate the entire geometry, so that you would have to include everything. Yeah? You would have to include radiation and uh, maybe heat losses to the walls. You would have to do, to do more than that. But then it really means that the, it's, it's uh, today. Even if you do the experiment, you will see it's very difficult. People doing experiments here. What happens when you do an experiment like this quite often is that the flame starts oscillating here before it quenches. And experimentalists, if you ask them for the, the, the exact value at which combustion stops, they will tell you, well, it's 0.54 plus or minus a few percent because it's a region where the measurements are difficult. You, because you know, there are other problems also. I didn't mention that. You have to ignite this flame. If you want to measure flame speed, you have to be able to ignite the flame. And that's also where theoreticians are marvelous people. They tell you, for example, that there are, there are mixtures which can produce a planar flame. They have a stable solution, but they cannot be ignited with a spark. In other words, if you put the, use the bomb, you put this mixture in the bomb, this mixture, if you would be able to go directly to a plane of flame, it would burn, but you cannot ignite it because of other processes. And so you cannot even measure it in this device, okay? Because to ignite, normally we use always a spark. So if you could be, if you would have a, a 2D spark, you know, a huge, a huge flame zone, then you could ignite it, but in the real world, you cannot ignite it. So maybe in the Siemens burner, 
you can have a flame like this, but in the experimental system, you cannot even ignite it. So it's really these zones here, or very lean flames, or very rich would be the same, huh, are very complicated. That's what it means. Yeah, well, you can have quenching due to purely uh, kinetic processes too. It's just that they usually they go to zero, you know, they go to zero continuously. But uh, they are not physical because any losses then changes the curve. So normally when you study this thing, you shouldn't do it with adiabatic uh, conditions. You have to measure the flow speed. Yeah, flow speed, uh, we can do the and from the... And that's the curve you will have. So it will decrease. Increase and decrease. So wha wha what is the flame speed? Well, what people would do, they would say the flame is somewhere in this zone. And uh, where the flame is, is corresponding to the flame speed. But remember that this is a displacement. You will measure displacement speed. You have to define where you measure it. If you are far away in the burn castles, it's not good because uh, you, are, you have uh, pollution by the velocity of the flow. You have to do it here somewhere. And so the question is, how do you do it? Do you take this value, this one, this one? Or some people would extrapolate this curve, saying if the density would be constant and the flame would be here, this is the speed I would obtain. And the whole game here on the Steinachian point flame is once you have this curve, how do you use it to deduce the speed? And that's, that's the difficult thing to do. You know, which speed do you take? And that's, it's, it's an ambiguous uh, problem. Yeah, you can take it here. Or it's not that small, actually. You see that uh, it can be, uh, it's, 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 it's as a finite thickness. So you take, he you take it here or here or here. You see? And uh, the trick is that uh, it doesn't really change the speed too much, but it changes the marketing length a lot. And so there's a whole bunch of papers on that where people have tried all kinds of methods. And today, uh, people concluded that it was, it was just too tough to, to use that to get uh, a, a precise measurement of speed. You have an, ev an evaluation of the speed. But it's, it's, it's a difficult one. Well, actually, there is no good way, okay? In all the methods, at the moment, no one has a good method to predict flame speed. So you can work on that one, but I, I would be very careful. Uh, how do you choose the point now where you say this is the flame? Because, it's, you know, if, if you go from here to there, that's a 20 percent, well, more than that, difference in flame speed. So is that the flame speed, or is this the flame speed? It's, it's tough. A question? Yeah, well, except it's not the same physical mechanisms. Uh, uh, a flame is not like an interface. It doesn't, well, well, somehow, yeah, you could say that, yeah, because it's the same for a surface tension. If you pull it too much, you will break it. But apart from that, uh, uh, I, I don't think you can use the analogy far further away. I think it's a... Uh yeah, yeah, sure. When you derive the equation for the... Actually, this equation here, which gives you the, the expression of flame speed, of a stretch, uh, <coughs> could, is exactly the same if you, if you derive it for an interface. You find the same expression. Except that interfaces... Uh, do not propagate norm, except if you have evaporation or condensation. So interfaces will have zero term here. Okay? So let's move now to the, the cases where we, we have this burner. And now, now we ignite it. Okay, so now, instead of having the equations I had before, without source terms, now there will be source terms. The fuel will be destroyed at the rate omega dot f, so that the oxidizer will be destroyed at the rate s omega dot f, where a is, is the stoichiometric ratio. And heat will be produced at the rate minus q omega dot f. And it's divided by Cp because I have taken the Cp to the other side, supposing that Cp was constant. Now, those are not 
passive scalars. They have source terms. But you see that if you look at these equations, because we have supposed we have single step chemistry and all these simplifications, if you take these equations, multiply it by S, and subtract it from that one, source terms will go away. Okay? And we'll be able to create a passive scalar equation. If I take this one, multiply it by minus Q over CP, I can add it to that one and get a passive scalar. And if I take that one, divided by S, multiply by Q over CP, I can also create a third passive scalar. So if you do that, you end up with passive scalars. And if you normalize their values between inlet and outlet, you can show easily that uh, the mixture fraction, because it's again the mixture fraction, this is a quantity here, which is the combination you recognize S, Y, F minus Y, O. Okay? This means S, Y, F minus Y, O is what you obtain when you add these two equations okay, to eliminate the source term. And then it's normalized in a way that it is 0 in the fuel, in the oxidizer, and 1 in the fuel. So for example, here, when you are in the fuel, y f is equal to y f zero and y o is zero, so s y f zero plus y o zero, that's one. Okay, and you do the same thing for all quantities. Now I'm using the COM I've shown before. Those are passive scalars going from zero in the oxidizer to one in the fuel, so they must be equal. So they're all equal. These three things are equal. Now if you look at these things, uh, the only thing which is changing here, the variable quantities are only y f, y o, and t. All the rest is constant. Okay. But still, I don't have a solution yet. I just have a combination of solutions. I know that I can relate fuel and oxidizer to my mixture fraction, but I'm not done yet. I need something more. And this is where we go into the, the, this idea of the infinitely fast chemistry assumption. So what means infinitely fast? Nothing is infinitely fast. Okay? That does not exist. We just mean by that that it's faster than any other process that we can have. So that really means that if you mix things, you do it much more slowly than combustion, and uh, which really means that combustion acts faster than anything else. And when, when you translate that into our world, it means that in our solutions, fuel and oxidizer can never coexist. At one point in the flow, if I have a non-zero fuel and oxidizer mass fraction, reaction will take place until one of the two disappears. So that really means that if you assume chemistry to be infinitely fast, it, in this equation, you cannot have yf and yo non-zero together uh, at the same place, at the same instant. And so uh, if you assume that, and you will see in a minute that uh, it's, uh, it's an assumption which requires to some care, that's it's actually enough to close the problem. So let's take an example. If fuel and oxidizer cannot coexist, it really means that in this flow, there will be two sides. There will be one side where yf is different from zero, and one side where yo is different from zero. We call that the rich side and the lean side. And uh, if I sit, for example, on the fuel side, the rich side, here, I know that Yo will be equal to 0. And here, it's the other way. So here, if I know that Yo is 0, I can express Yf as a function of z. And that's what's written here. And you can express it this way. Yf of z is Yf0 multiplied by z minus z stoichiometric divided by 1 minus z stoichiometric. And z stoichiometric is a quantity I will define in a second. It's a combination of the of this thing here. I will give that in a second. So on the fuel side, Yo will be 0. And the temperature will be given by this expression, which is, again, a combination of the temperature of the fuel multiplied by z, the temperature of the oxidizer multiplied by 1 minus z, and then a term here, which is the heat release. So if you plot these lines, you can do the same thing on the uh, oxidizer side. And you end up with these famous lines. So uh, these lines here are the mixing lines I've plotted before. And those lines here correspond to the equilibrium lines. So this is the lines where you will find the points, all the points of the flow after combustion. Now, uh, 
you can build all kinds of diagrams like this one, a little bit more complicated, and we'll use that in turbulent combustion modeling. Uh, you can have the equilibrium lines, but then you can, instead of going to equilibrium, you can stop a little bit before. You can say if I have some stretch, for example, then I will have lines like this one. That's a strained flamelet. That's the equilibrium lines. We'll use that later. Now, okay, you could say uh, it's very nice to produce a plot like this one, but that's not what I want. I mean, if I'm working in a company, I want to give people the fuel and the oxidizer and the temperature fields as a function of time and space. And for the moment, I don't have that. So why do I do all this? Well, this is a major simplification now because uh, with Z uh, and this formulation, we're going to have uh, uh, a simple solution to a problem. How do we do it? <coughs> Our initial problem was that one. We had to solve the equation for fuel oxidizer and temperature with source terms. Okay? Those were Arrhenius terms. Writing a code for that is extremely complicated. Now, instead of that, the only thing we need to do is solve the Z equation, which is a passive scalar equation with one on the fuel side, zero on the oxidizer side, so that's easy. And once we know Z, we just have to come here and read y t yf, yo, and t. So it's a much simpler process when, when you write a code. Okay? Because the only code you need to write, actually, is a code which solves the mixture fracture equation with no source term. And uh, you will see that for turbulent combustion, we use that a lot. I would say that maybe 90% of the, co of the turbulent combustion models are based on this idea of using Z and from Z getting all the other variables. So let, let me show you a few uh, useful properties of the, of the mixture fraction. We are now in a world of uh, diffusion flame, but the mixture fraction can be also defined for a premix flame. And in a premix flame, there's a useful property of mixture fraction is that the mixture fraction Z does not change through a premix flame front. It's actually an obvious thing if you remember that the mixture fraction just tells you how much mass you have used to prepare your mixture. But these proportions will not change if you burn it. You know, whether it's cold or burnt, it's the same. But you can prove it easily if you say that you have an initial state YF1 and YO1. And after combustion, you know that the fuel will decrease in the proportion minus delta YF1, whatever delta is for the moment. And if the fuel decreases by this quantity, the oxidizer will decrease by this quantity. If you compute Z2, the mixture fraction after that, you see that these terms cancel and you end up with the same value as Z1. So through a flame front, Z does not change. It's a good test, actually, when you do a code. Uh, verify that uh, in your 1D premix flame, the mixture fraction should be a constant. Now, this property also allows you to have a different view on what a diffusion flame really is. A diffusion flame in the real space is here. In the Z space, it's here. It's a view here where you say, I, have mi I am mixing oxidizer with fuel. If I mix them first, what I'm really doing is to take a point here where I'm using 1 minus Z of the oxidizer and Z of the fuel. So I will be sitting on this mixing line. Once I have, I'm sitting here, I haven't burned yet, what I can do now is burn. If I burn, I burn exactly as if I would be in a premix flame. So I will burn along this line and come up here. Okay? So you see that the diffusion flame is a succession on, of mixing followed by combustion. And you see also that this really means that in a diagram like this one, all the points that you can measure, you've heard yesterday a nice talk about diagnostics. If you do diagnostics on a flame like this and you measure Z, Y fuel, Y O, and temperature, Everything should be located in this triangle. You cannot be outside just because you, know, you cannot burn more than what you have, and you cannot be colder than what you have. So if you plot temperature, you should be in this triangle. Now, <coughs> th there are limits to this business. Okay? Uh, the idea that uh, we will actually split our problem in two parts, one part where we need to find the mixture fraction locally, and then if you have Z, then we can have the flame structure. That's a nice idea, and it's used everywhere. The question is, can you really do it? Uh, we have used many assumptions to come here. The first assumption was that the Lewis numbers were equal. And you have shown yesterday that the Lewis numbers are not equal. Okay, so that's a major problem. 
we keep doing it, but uh, still we know that uh, in the real world, Lewis numbers are not equal, so the definition itself of Z is a problem. So people have tried to go around that for a while. Uh, uh, we said, for example, that we need a single step reaction. So we, when we construct uh, a mixture fraction for H2 plus O2 goes to H2O, we would say it's SYH2 minus YO2, and you normalize it the right way, so it would give you this, where S is equal here to 8. And we know that this is not a good definition because H2 is diffusing so fast that uh, uh, if we would build an equation for Z1, uh, we would not be able to have a mixture fraction for that guy. So some people said, OK, there are other solutions. Instead of building the mixture fractions like that one, there are other things which are conserved in combustion. For example, uh, the total mass of carbon. The total carbon cannot go anywhere, OK? We are not decomposing carbon into some anything. So if we construct something based on carbon, or any atom, actually, it's also a uh, conserved quantity. So many people try that. For example, if you want to build something on hydrogen, you're going to look at all the places where you can find hydrogen in this flame. So you have hydrogen in H2, in H, in H2O, in OH, etc. So you build a mixture fraction which contains all the parts, all the mass of the H atom, wherever it is. And you say this is a mixture fraction because you scale it the right way and you say it's a mixture fraction. If you look at Bilger and Pope, uh, uh, they have defined also uh, a mixture fraction which they consider to be the best. It's a mixture fraction based on carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And they say it's a reasonable mixture fraction. But you see, by the way, that uh, it cannot be true because uh, even if you construct something like this, which is conserved in the case of an homogeneous reaction, if you have transport, because each thing here diffuses differently, this is not going to be a real mixture fraction. And Barlow, Barlow is the, uh, the guy at Sandia who has worked probably the most on these problems. He has tried something simple. He's plotting here. He has computed all the mixture fraction he could. And he's plotting the mixture fractions, all of them versus one. So if all the mixture fractions were equal, all the points should be on that line. And you see that uh, depending on the definition of the mixture fraction, you have differences. So that really tells you that's due to the fact that the Lewis numbers are not the same. In the end, in a real flow, there is no such thing as a real mixture fraction, just because all elements diffuse at different speed. And uh, you will see that, uh, uh, again, that's what I said when I started this course, you don't, don't want to be a perfectionist. The, the benefits of working with Z are so large that a lot of people say, OK, let's do it anyway. But you have to remember it's, uh, it's, it's probably not a good idea. OK, for diffusion flames, we also need to talk about stretch. In the same way that you stretch a premix flame, you can stretch a diffusion flame. A diffusion flame is a, uh, an, uh, a surface, so you can stretch it. And, uh, the trick which is interesting is that stretch for diffusion flames has a very different effect compared to stretch in premix flames. Uh, the literature is full of studies on this problem. And uh, uh, interestingly, for some reason, uh, people there replace stretch by something else for diffusion flame, which we will call scalar dissipation. So what is scalar dissipation? Scalar dissipation is this quantity. It's two times the diffusivity multiplied by the gradient of the mixture fraction square. Uh, scalar dissipation has a nice property that it does not depend on the flame orientation. When you want to compute flame stretch, you need to uh, compute the flow velocity in the plane tangent to the flame. That's painful uh, because you need to recognize where the flame is. This quantity does not depend on that. You just take the gradient of Z, square it, and that's done. And you can show easily, I'm going to do it in a second, that for simple cases, stretch and scalar dissipation are actually uh, directly related. That's the simplest stagnation point flame you can do. So you blow oxidizer on one side, fuel on the other side. The flame is sitting here. And uh, if you write the equations for this thing, you can prove that uh, scalar dissipation is actually proportional to stretch with some kind of funny expression behind it. But uh, talking about a stretched diffusion flame is the same thing as talking about a diffusion flame 
submitted to scalar dissipation. Okay. Both of them are the same quantity. They measure the stretch of the flame. So you can work, and you see in the literature, you can work either with stretch or with scalar dissipation. Now, that's a plot of, uh, of fields of velocities and temperature in a diffusion flame. So you see that uh, for a flow like this, the velocity looks almost, almost linear, which is what you expect for a stretched flame, okay? because it's constant gradient. The temperature is maximum at the center and goes down on both sides. You recognize also that this is a very different structure from a premix flame. A premix flame is cold, and then it's burnt, and it's burnt until you know, the outlet of the system. Here, it's cold on both sides, and there is a maximum in the center. These flames are very sensitive to stretch. So how do we know that? Well, you, you, know, it, uh, uh, you know it already, because uh, if you try to light a fire, you know that uh, fires, wood fires, they are actually diffusion flames. You burn the air with the gas coming out of the wood. And you know that you have to blow on it. And you, when you blow on it, it, it's burning much more. And that's because you can prove for a diffusion flame that the reaction weight in the diffusion flame, how much fuel you burn, is directly controlled to the by the square root of the stretch. So the more you stretch, the more you burn. And it's, it's, and it's going up fast. Okay? Which really means that uh, if you put here stretch, and here you put the reaction weight in the diffusion flame, it's going up like the square root. So you, you need to blow on the flame if you want it to burn. Now, there is a limit to that. Of course, if you stretch it too much, it's the same thing on your fire. If you blow too strongly on your fire, then you quench it completely. Okay? So that really mean, means that in the diffusion flame, when you blow slowly, you burn more. And if you blow too strongly, then poof, the flame will quench. So you have to be careful, you know, because in this zone here, you can lose everything if you try to, be, you know, to have too much uh, flame going on at the same time. Stretch, I mean, large stretch values are always leading to quenching. That's clear. In diffusion flames, like in uh, lean premix flames, the same mechanism. Yeah, you, you, will, you, will, you will quench any flame if you stretch it too much. That's, uh, there is no exception to that. Just because at some point, you know, here, uh, the, the chemical time will, uh, will, be, will not be small enough to keep up with what you do. You have to realize what stretch means for a diffusion flame. Um, when you talk about stretch in a diffusion flame, it really means here that you get uh, the zone of reaction. And here, you are injecting the gases. And uh, imagine you are the guy here doing the burning. You are infinitely strong. You, know, you are infinitely fast. So here. If I send you things to burn at one meter per second, you're going to say, oh, cool, I can do that. I have plenty of time to do it. Then if I send at 10 meters per second, then you will have to burn 10 times faster. You're going to say, OK, I can still do it. But if I keep increasing stretch, I go to 100 or to 1,000, and at some point, my chemical times, even if I'm very good at burning, at some point, I'm going to say, hey, this is too much, and if I will quench. Okay. So you can quench any flame if you stretch it sufficiently. Ah, yeah, you can. This point here is like for premix flames. You can obtain it experimentally, or you can obtain it uh, by theory, or you can obtain it with a numerical code. Stagnation point flame codes will always al also give you this point. But this point, again, depends on losses uh, and on kinetics. So it's, uh, again, it's a. Uh, the exact value of that point is uh, not that easy to find. OK, so the expression of stretch in a diffusion flame is the same than what it is in a, in a premix flame, except that this term in general is small because diffusion flames don't really move. You know, they, they don't propagate. A premix flame propagates. A diffusion flame cannot propagate because if, if it goes away, you know, uh, it's, it's stuck between the two streams. It cannot go anywhere. Now, when we we'll go to the turbulent session, we'll need to find a way to estimate the stretch of all these flames as a function of 
the turbulent quantities. And you will see that this is really the, 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 the most difficult thing. And this is also the place where the, the uncertainties are going to become extremely large. So let me conclude by saying something about uh, other flames. The premix flames and the pure diffusion flames are not the only flames you find uh, in the real world. Unfortunately, there are other flames. So I just want to mention two examples which are quite important, the partially premix flames and the triple flames. So I'll start with the triple flame. So what is a triple flame? That's an interesting animal that was discovered actually very recently, probably 15 years ago now. And the triple flame is the, the animal, the, the, the structure, which allows to understand how it is possible in a diffusion flame to have the mixing lines and the equilibrium lines, and how do you go from one to the other? Which is another way of saying, if I have now a classical diffusion flame structure, I'm injecting fuel and oxidizer, and here I know that if this flame ignites, here I will have an a state which corresponds to this state. The flame will be burning. But then, just that, ignition, just that injection here, things are not ignited yet. So here, I should be on the mixing line. So how do I go from the mixing line to the equilibrium lines? The other way to formulate the same question is, how does this flame ignite? You know, what allows this flame to stabilize? It's, it seems like uh, if you would travel like this, you know, if you would do a parabolic computation, you would enter the flow here. You arrive here. This is cold and this is cold. There's no reason to ignite. And if you keep going, you know, you will never ignite. There must be something to ignite this diffusion flame. And this is the triple flame. There are hundreds of theories. I really believe that the triple flame theory is the best now to understand how this happens. So what is a triple flame? A triple flame is actually the animal which will allow us to go from this to that. And uh, as I said here, you are mixing. Here you are ignited. So how do you do that? Well, you have this triple flame animal. This was visualized probably by Keone. I think it's a Cambridge paper uh, 20 years ago. That's a direct view, and you see why we call it triple. It has this uh, uh, triple branch here. One, two, three. So this is a triple flame. We also call them edge flames because they are at the edge of the flame. And you, you really see the transition. In front of the triple flame, there is no combustion. Behind the triple flame, very far away, there is a diffusion flame. Now also, if we start looking into the details of this thing, uh, here, that's a premix flame, which disappears. And here is another premix flame, which disappears too. This one is a rich premix flame. This one is a lean premix flame. So why is this thing useful? Well, this thing propagates against the flow. It's like the, the, the head of the, the flame. And this thing is continuously moving to try to ignite this thing. You need this guy here, because it's the only information which allows the flame to begin. As I said before, if there would not be any mechanism propagating in this direction, this thing will never ignite. You need to get this thing to stabilize. Now, you can compute these animals. This has been done now many times. And uh, you, you, you do a simulation. You can do that with DNS. And that really means that the triple flame is the, the structure of the flame which allows this flame to propagate here. And when the speed of the triple flame is equal to the flow speed, then the flame stops there. That's where the flame will remain. So <coughs> this flame propagate. And interestingly, they propagate faster than the laminar flame, the premix laminar flame. They propagate at a speed which is the laminar flame speed multiplied by the square root of the density ratio. That's, again, it's theory which tells you that. So in a flow like this one, they will propagate you know, at uh, uh, 100 centimeters per second, maybe, in for ambient temperature and pressure. And so this point here will propagate against the flow. The flow goes in that way. And where the flame stops will be the root of the flame. That's the place where the flame will start. The second class of flames that we need to discuss is what we call partially premixed flames. Uh, there are many cases where we would like to believe, we would like to hope that uh, 
the PDF of equivalence ratio will look like this. What the PDF says is basically telling you the spread uh, of uh, the values around the mean here. Uh, you, we like to believe, for example, that we have a flow at equivalence ratio 0.83, so that all points in the mixture have exactly 0.83 equivalence ratio. But in practice, we know it's not true. In many cases, the mixing system that we have is not perfect, so we have some distribution around this value. This can be on purpose, or this can be just because our mixing line were not long enough. Remember, if you put your mixer very far away upstream of the burner, you will go to the perfect limit because you, are, you will have a long time to mix. It will be more dangerous. It will be more expensive. If you bring your mixing system close to the flame, then you will start spreading this value. So instead of having a premix flame at 0.83, you will have a, 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 a series of premix flames going from you know, 0.7 to 0.85. So for the modeling, it's not going to be a perfectly premix flame. We call it a partially premix flame. The, the most uh, famous example of such a flame is the Prekinsta burner. So that's a burner installed in Germany. And uh, the air is coming from that side here. And the fuel is injected here. And the fuel is injected not in the chamber. It's injected upstream in the swirler passages here. And that's what the Germans call technically premixed. Because the idea was that there was enough time. You see the hole of injections are here. So the air is coming this way. The fuel is injected in a cross flow. There is mixing. And the idea was that, OK, uh, the distance here is sufficient so that it's premixed. And we've been studying this thing for years as if it was premixed. So in the simulation, we would remove the fuel. We would inject the fuel here with the air and go. And then uh, it was not working very well. And then finally, these guys from, uh, from DLR, they looked at uh, the mixing. They can do that because they have equipment which allows them to measure mixture fraction. Uh, to mix measuring mixture fraction requires to measure species. So you can do that with laser diagnostics. And normally, when they measure mixture fraction, we should have found a single function. You know? But the trick is that at the inflow, they measured it here, in this zone, you can see that the spread, the distribution of mixture fraction was huge, which really says that uh, it's not premixed at all, actually. It's, uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 places, there are lots of places here where we don't have an homogeneous mixture. We have a very wide distribution from very lean to very rich. And of course, for the models, it's changing a lot of things because it's not a premix flame. So these partially premix flames we're going to find uh, in many cases in industry, gas turbines. Most of them are partially premixed just because we don't have enough place to let the mixing take place. I have just a few minutes to introduce now the, what will be a big piece in this course, which is uh, turbulent combustion. But if you have questions on this section, maybe we can discuss them now. No? So if not, uh, I want to uh, start talking business now. Um, so this is turbulent combustion now. So now the element I'm going to add to the problem is turbulence. So just. Uh, Again, to make sure who, uh, who knows what here. Uh, who has already studied turbulent combustion here? Yeah, the, the Siemens people. Huh? So, of course, a uh, few, few, few people in the room. Uh, and who has studied turbulence? Who knows what the Kolmogorov theory is? Few, few, few people, yeah? So minus five thirds and all this business. Uh, and who knows how the K epsilon model works? <coughs> Once people. OK, <coughs> so um, I'm going to go not too fast. So that's the outline of what I want to say. I will describe today probably the phenomenology of turbulent flames. And then uh, I will go into uh, the modeling. Because basically, I guess what the modeling is, that's what's important for you. And uh, I will make a big difference between modeling academic flames, such as perfectly premixed or perfect diffusion flames, and then talk about what it takes to model the real flames. And uh, again, the world is split in two people working in universities who can simplify the problem to a point where we can apply the nice tools we have, and people working in industry who have to model their, their flames, not the flames they would like to model. And that, you will see, it's a, there are big differences there. <coughs> so I just want to describe first the differences between laminar and turbulent flames. 
talk about the turbulent flame diagram, the turbulent flame speeds, and about averaging. I, I won't do all that today, but uh, we can start. So just remember that uh, a turbulent flame is the result of the interaction between the flame fronts, premix, diffusion, what you want, and the turbulent flow. And uh, you remember that I showed you this movie about what turbulence is. I just want here to quote, that's a famous one, uh, a statement here by uh, a famous guy, the Lamb, Lamb was the guy who created the Lamb vortex, you know, and this guy was not really optimistic about turbulence. You know. It seems that uh, <coughs> there are many fields, many people tell you, okay, I'd rather do quantum mechanics, you know, than turbulence. Simpler. And uh, Schrodinger equation, for example, my, one, one of my students told me, I'm coming back to Schrodinger equation. I mean, turbulence is too complicated. So we have to handle not only turbulence, <coughs> but we have to handle turbulence and, and combustion. Okay. Uh, the one thing you should not do is to believe that people selling commercial CFD codes have solved this problem because they will tell you they have. They have. It's not a problem. It's in the code. Okay. No, it's not true. Uh, at the same, we need to do something, but you don't want to underestimate the problem. And that's what too many people are doing at the moment. So turbulent flame. If the flow feeding a flame is turbulent, the flame becomes turbulent too. Okay? That's the first thing. You cannot avoid it. So, and normally, as at large flow rates, this happens all the time. So we have to study turbulent flames. Just to remind you of how these things are doing, uh, if you have flow in a duct, you know that uh, this flow in this duct will become turbulent as soon as the Reynolds number is more than 2,000 or something like that. Which really means that if you have a duct, you can define the critical mass flow through which, uh, after which you will have turbulence. If you compute now the ma critical mass flow rates that you can allow yourself to have a laminar flame, you will see that uh, it's not much actually. If you go to the lab and you have a burner with a one centimeter diameter, the critical flow rate is 0.2 grams per second before it gets turbulent. So uh, you can do that in the lab, okay? You can, you can create l experiments which are so slow that they remain laminar. But as soon as you go in the lab and you do a burner of 5 centimeters, it's going to be turbulent almost right away. It's very difficult to have a flame stabilized on a 5 centimeter system. And then if you go to a gas turbine, then of course the gas turbine will blow more than a kilogram per second and the flow rate is 1 before you have turbulence. So there is no way you can escape turbulence. It will be there all the time. Now the next, the next slide is probably the only one to remember. It's that uh, if you're doing a PhD on laminar flames and you get the flame speed with an error which is more than 3%, you know, it can be 10. You know, we have shown you before that there were some errors. But you know, if you are more than 15% away, your advisor will say, hey, it's not good. You know, do something. You go back. There's something wrong. You have, to, you have to find the flame speed more precisely if it's laminar. If I give you now this turbulent combustion system, which is an annular chamber in a gas turbine, and I don't give you the result, and you can go see, you know, Fluent, CFX, Converge, all these guys, and you don't give them the result, then I'll tell you that the uncertainty is 100%. They won't be able to tell you if it burns or not. And that's the state of the art today. If you don't have the experimental result, no one can guarantee that your CFD code will give you the result. It's just not true. It's just not true. And it's actually the same thing that when you design these burners, we keep saying that engineers don't create burners. They change burners. You take a combustor, usually something designed by the Germans in the 40s, you know, and you modify it slowly, slowly, because if you go fast, you don't know where you are. Because today, Predicting if a burner like this will ignite or not is extremely difficult. Now, if it is ignited, and if you can you know, tune your CFD results to match that, then you can use it you know, to extrapolate, change things, flow rate, shapes a little bit, but not too much. If you, for example, take this burner, make it five times larger, you don't know anything. You're on your own. And uh, that's something you need to say first, OK? Just we have to admit that it's very complicated. It's not going to be something that you can just come out and get a result for it. The other thing you have to say, in addition to it is complicated, it's to say also it's useful. This is my motorcycle. You know. So uh, the, the motorcycles, you know, as I said before, turbulent combustion is really needed. If we wouldn't have turbulent combustion, we would not be able to operate engines. We need this effect of increasing the flame speed. So this thing was not obvious. When it was discovered, that was uh, uh, 
100 years ago again, the way people were doing that in that time, they were working on tanks, you know, and trucks for the army, and they were asking themselves simple questions. They were saying, okay, how much time does it take to burn something? So they were having a bomb again, already 100 years ago. You take a bomb and you ignite a flame there. And you take a look at the time it takes for the pressure to reach its maximum value. You know, it would go from one bar to eight bars. And you say, this is a speed. Okay, it gives me a speed of combustion or combustion time. And you would plot the combustion time here in a milliseconds as a function, for example, of the composition. This is a result obtained in 1910 or something like this. It's reported in the book of Lafitte in 1939. And uh, when you do that and you have a quiescent flow initially, this is the combustion time you have. It is minimum at stoichiometry. And it goes up here. And when you reach flammability limits, it is infinite. OK, it makes sense. And what these guys did at that time, they recognized, even 100 years ago, that if the flow is moving, then it's different. How do they move the flow? You take the bomb and you add fans. So you turn the fans, that creates turbulence, and then you ignite. And what they saw is that the combustion time was less. Okay? So they recognized already in those days that more turbulence leads to faster combustion. So that's good. That's a good thing. The mistake they made at that time, they say that because here there's a factor of two, they said, OK, when there is turbulence, it goes two times faster. That, that's a good model, OK? You just multiply the speed by two. But of course, we know it's not two. In that case, it was two. If you change the speed of the fans, it will be more or less. I mean, it's not that simple. And the main factor which leads to that is wrinkling. You see here pictures, that's experimental pictures, uh, where you see the flame front at one instant. This is tomography, typically. And uh, you recognize that there is here much more surface than for a flat flame. So if there is more surface, we will burn more fuel. If we burn more fuel, combustion time will be less. So that's good. We get more power for the same cost. The only thing we need to do is to shake the flow, and then we get more power. Very convenient. It's also very efficient in terms of power, because shaking a flow here, making it turbulent doesn't cost much. You, know, you just add an obstacle, and you get vortices. But then you get much more power, and that's very useful. So that's really the most important thing here. One of the things also that you can recognize in these pictures is that really we recognize a flame here, which looks like a small flame element. We'll come back to that. It's the flamelet approach. If this is a small laminar flame, then everything I've told you before we'll be able to, to, to use. OK, I will stop here for today. And uh, tomorrow, we'll really get into the turbulent combustion part. Any question on that? Nope. So we have a, a short break. OK, thank you.